Alrighty, so for those who are unfamiliar with the topic for today, we're <clears throat> going to be looking at Gaius, Diotrephes, and Demetrius. And uh, so our reading will be from 3rd John. All right, so everybody can open up the 3rd John because I'll, I'll read through it. Um, and then the, it's in the class, basically, uh, remarks are made towards certain verses. We're not, we're not going to go up by a verse by verse exposition by any means. Um, I don't think that's probably the best approach for this chapter. Um, I think the, uh, the meaning or the purpose of this, of this letter, <clears throat> in, in that it has been preserved for us, um, is something that lies just below the surface, but once we, once we get a glimpse of it, um, I think we will understand it very, very clearly, and it is very, a very powerful exhortation. So, Third John, the elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy love before the ecclesia, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. I wrote unto the Ecclesia, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, receives us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he does, prating, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither does he himself receive the brethren, and forbids them that would, and casts them out of the ecclesia. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that does good is of God, he that does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has good report of all men, and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee, but I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee, our friends salute thee, greet the friends by name. Now again, I'm not going to go verse by verse through this, but rather we're going to focus our, our remarks on these three men, these three brethren, Gaius, Diotrephes, and Demetrius. But I think that it's very, very interesting. When we get to talk about Demetrius, keep in mind what John says in verse 14. Uh, basically, in verses 13 and 14, he, he has many things to say, but he doesn't want to through pen and ink. He wants to sit down with the ecclesia and speak face to face. And part of that is the problem. The reason why he wanted to speak face to face is the problem that Diotrephes was causing. Now, one thing that's pretty interesting is when you look at the names of these three brethren, all three are related to pagan or to the Greek mythology. Okay, So what we understand from this is that these men were Gentiles, and they were drawn out of that world. And their names, each one of their names is a, is a marker to the, to the point of the letter. It, again, at least in, in the way it has been preserved for us. Uh, originally, uh, you know, it, it, it speaks to the character of Gaius and Diotrephes in a contrast. Um, but the Spirit has preserved it in such a manner that we can look below the surface uh, and, uh, and hopefully, again, pull out excitations for our lives. All right. So the intent of the letter and, and the way that we have it now, uh, again, in that the Spirit has preserved it, 
um, is that it presents a very interesting contrast of character for us. Uh, the two main individuals, Gaius and Diotrephes, are presented as an antithesis of each other. And the manner in which they are described in these verses uh, provide a very strong excitation for us. And the contrast that we find between these men is actually presented in the meaning of their names. So first, we have Gaius. Now, Brother H.P. suggests that his name means, I am glad. But I haven't been able to find that anywhere in any concordance or anything like that. So I don't know where Brother H.P. got that from. I'm not saying that it's not true, but I did find something very different. Um, I looked in Strong's, and Strong's defines the name as Lord but it doesn't provide any supporting references or root words or, or anything. So it's one of those things that at the end of the uh, strong, uh, the definitions you have additional meaning and it, they put what they think the name means. So that there's actually no support for it. Well, I found a, uh, an online encyclopedia of Greek names and I was, um, able to find something there that I, that I found nowhere else. And the definition that they give in this encyclopedia fits perfectly in the context of this letter as it's opened up to us. Again, you know, it'll, it'll become clear as we go along. So the Greek word that most suggests is the basis for Gaius is a Gai. G-A-I-A. -A. Now, Gai was a uh, personification of the earth in Greek mythology, okay? And Gai itself comes from a Greek word, Gi, G-E. And that is a word that's used in scripture for earth. A very familiar verse, Matthew 5, verse 5, the meek shall inherit the earth. That's the Greek word, Gi. Okay. It's also translated as land, and we see that in Hebrews 11, where the writer is speaking of Abraham, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise. It's key. Okay, so the, the, the root for Gaius' name, apparently, comes from this Greek word, gi. And what that means is that Gaius, in, in some way, in what is presented in Scripture, is related, or he's linked to the earth. Okay? Now, we, we, we need to contrast that against Diotrephes. Now, Diotrephes is actually two words in the Greek. Dios, which links this man to the mythological Zeus, and specifically, it, it's more literally translated, the brightness of the sky. Uh, apparently because that's where Zeus lived or resided. It was in the, the brightness of the sky, right? So that's the dios. The trephes means to be nourished by. Okay? So quite literally, nourished by Zeus or nourished by the brightness of the sky. And this is telling in, in the, as this man is brought out in the letter because John says that Diotrephes loves to have preeminence, okay? He loved to be first. And by that, it means he loved to have authority over his brethren. So his name means nourished by the brightness of the sky. And to me, his character demonstrates that he fed off any glory that was afforded to him by those brethren who he thought were under him. So we get the picture. Gaius, down here on the earth. Diotrephes, up here in the sky. Okay, that's the contrast that is 
uh, at the heart of this letter. And we notice, don't we, how different John's manner is towards these two men and the way that he addresses them in the letter. To Gaius, he says, whom I love in the truth. Now, we should note that the definitive article is not in the original Greek. So John says, whom I love in truth. So what he's saying is, Gaius, who I truly love. And this is very similar to the opening remarks in the previous letter where he says, the elder unto the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that who have known the truth. So this is similar to 3 John. The phrase is, the elect lady and her children who I truly love, but the definitive article is in the phrase at the end of that verse, they that have known the truth. So those who have known the truth, like John, love this lady. And those who know the truth, like John, speak very highly of Gaius. So, in regards to the, to the elect lady of 2 John and to Gaius of 3 John, there was a, a love for these people that was rooted in appreciation for their love for the truth, for their love for the things of the truth. In the second letter, which is not our subject today, is presented in one manner, but Gaius' love for the truth for which others loved him is clearly demonstrated. So the Ga Gaius, again, not only did John love him, but other brethren witnessed to the manner in which Gaius lived in truth. If you look at the verse 3 there, you notice it says, walks in the truth. Even the, okay, the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. Well, once again, the definitive article is not there in the original Greek. Gaius walks, or he lived, in truth. Well, what does that mean to us? Well, it means he wasn't a hypocrite. That which he believed, he lived. It was truth to him, and he manifested it, and he was faithful to that. So this phrase un reveals a consistency and a sincerity in his actions. Basically what I'm trying to say is that Gaius was genuine in what he did. And of course, there's an excitation to that, isn't there? That we need to be genuine. We need to do the things that we do for the sake of the truth because we believe the truth and we love the truth and we love our brethren and we love our Savior and we love our God. And if, if that love for the truth is in us, and the truth dwells in our hearts because it's been put there through the influence of the word, then that is the genuine motivation for our lives. 
And that's Gaius. We're not told that he did great and wondrous things. But what he did, he did faithfully. Because he believed it to be true. He believed it to be right. So, again, it it, it speaks of a sincerity of, of character. And anything else is to be avoided, as, Paul, as Peter tells us, wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking, we are to lay aside guile and hypocrisy. It's not to be part of our lives. It's part of that nature of flesh that we're supposed to crucify. So when we do things for the truth, we do it because we love the truth. Not because we want someone to say, oh, isn't brother so-and-so wonderful? Look at all the things that he does. That was diatrophies. And that's a character we need to avoid. Think about this, too. How many times does the Lord say, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? Six times in the record. Six times, right after the woe unto you. So they were hypocrites. They did the things that they did, seeking the glory of men. Gaius did things differently. He was living or behaving sincerely. And that was his, that's, that speaks to the innermost character. So his, what he did, you know, his, his character wasn't something that he put on for show. That, so that he might be praised of men. That's what the scribes and the, and the Pharisees as hypocrites saw. It. They wore their godliness or righteousness, if you will, as a badge on their sleeve, as a, as a thing of honor. That's all with Gaius. Gaius did what he did because he believed it to be the, the right thing to do. And that is John's, that's not my estimation, by the way, of Gaius' behavior. That's John's estimation. So he says in verse 5, Thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. So faithfully, well, we can draw actually two ideas from that. Faithfully, primarily for us, speaks of believing. So what John is saying is, because you believed it to be right, that's what you did. And much could be said about that. But also to act faithfully means to act with a certain consistency. And what that means is Gaius could be trusted to do these things. He did them faithfully. So in one sense, he did them because he believed it to be right, but you could count on Gaius. And do the brethren count on us? Can you count on me? Can I count on you? That's that's what we're seeing here. That's what John is saying. You do these things faithfully. And he does them for the brethren and the strangers. Now, strangers there doesn't mean Gentiles in the, in the sense of what you might normally mean. What, what John is speaking about is you're doing it to the brethren and, and you don't even know who they are. Because these were brethren who were traveling about. And Gaius, he, he saw his, his duty, if you will, his responsibility. So what we see in verse 6 if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort. That's what Gaius thought was his responsibility. Apparently somebody disagrees. (laughs) Okay. All right. Now, I want to to look at that. So we we, we got this background that Gaius was, was sincere and he was faithful and he was trustworthy. But what did he do? Well, let's read verses 6 through 8 from the NIV. 
You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought, therefore, to show hospitality to such men, so that we might work together for the truth. So what Gaius was doing is he was providing the things which those who were traveling about preaching the gospel, fulfilling the commission that Christ had given them, he was providing the things which they needed. Again, they went out for the sake of the name. And the Lord uses the same idea concerning Saul when he said to Ananias, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So bearing the name in this context is those who were traveling about preaching the gospel. Very simple. We understand that. So this is the work that Gaius was doing. He was bringing them forward on their journey, or as the RSV reads, sending them on their journey as befits God's service. Understandably, there were needs for these brethren as they traveled through the empire bearing the gospel of Christ. They were dependent upon those who would have been sympathetic to their cause for material support. Food, water, clothing, these would have been needed. And these preachers, because of their work, they were following or they were living the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 6, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? That was not their first concern. Their first concern was the preaching of the gospel. And so, as they traveled about, they were taking no thought for what they would eat, for what they would drink, or how they would be clothed. And it was Gaius who was providing the next phrase from the Sermon on the Mount. Gaius was supplying the part where the Lord says, your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. So it was the believer who took no thought for these things. Was he expected to simply stand there with his hands out, waiting for something to fall out of heaven? Of course not. The Father provided the needs of those who took no thought for these things through men and women, or I should say, brothers and sisters, like Gaius. That is how the Father worked. He worked in the hearts and minds of brothers and sisters to provide those things which are necessary for the preaching of the gospel. So that those who were doing that work literally could take no thought. They're leaving one city, going to another. They're not, they don't know where they're going necessarily or how they're going to be taken care of. They trust in the Father to provide that. And he does because he's faithful. He provides again, through brothers and sisters like Gaius. And it's interesting, isn't it, to see what John says. He says in verse 8, this is an exhortation for everyone. We therefore ought to receive such, and by receiving such, he means to do this work which Gaius was doing for the support of the work, that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. Fellow helpers to the truth. And so often we neglect this aspect of our 
work in the truth. If we hand out leaflets, advertising a seminar, that means we're fellow helpers in the work. If we bake cookies and bring coffee to a lecture, we're fellow helpers. Making sure that the hall is clean and the grass is cut. Playing the prelude, which signals for everyone to sit down because it's about to begin. Staying after to speak with visitors and staying even later to help clean up. That's being a fellow helper, supporting the work, being there to support the speaker who is providing the, the, the talk to the, to the public. All these things are fellow helping. And they're incredibly important. But sometimes, because of life, we find it, well, maybe not easy, but convenient to not be there. And John says, by helping those who are doing the work, we are helping the truth. We can't, we can't diminish the importance of that exhortation. We do things as an ecclesia, as a body, not as individuals. An individual may be chosen to speak, but he's speaking on behalf of the ecclesia. Whether you're talking about a seminar or a lecture or a Bible class or a Sunday school, There is a lot of support that can be given, and it's very, very important. So Gaius wasn't the one traveling about doing the preaching. That wasn't his thing. Instead, he was commended for his spirit of service as being a fellow helper to the work that was being done by providing the things which were necessary for his brethren. So what would we say is Gaius's main character trait that links him to the thought of the root of his name, a member of the earth? Gaius served. You can't say it any more simply or more eloquently than that. He served. He was humble, but he was generous. He was lowly but he was thoughtful. He was down here in the place of the servant. He wasn't seeking for glory, some great thing that he might do. He was satisfied with doing what he could do, serving in a manner that befit him, and he faithfully executed that duty. So now we need to look at the other side. You talk about Diotrephes. And he was as opposite to Gaius as could possibly be. Now, John spoke of love for Gaius. What about Diotrephes? For this brother, John had stern words. I will remember his deeds. And none of those deeds, brothers and sisters, were good. The RSV translates these words in verse 10 as, I will bring up what he is doing. Now think about verse 14, where John says, I am going to come, and I am going to speak with you face to face, and I am going to bring up these things that Diotrephes is doing. No more pen and paper. I'm going to speak with you face to face. Because John, in his heart, needs to fulfill Matthew 18. And Brother Mansfield brought that out in a very interesting way. So what he says about the relationship or this, in, in this letter between uh, John and Diotrephes, the fact that John was actually giving Diotrephes a warning. 
Brother Mansfield writes, the apostle is administering a rebuke to Diotrephes based upon Christ's instruction in Matthew 18. He had first remonstrated with Diotrephes privately to no avail, verse 9. He had sent messengers who had been treated in a similar manner. Now the apostle states his intention of laying the facts before the ecclesia. Now we're familiar with those verses from Matthew 18, right? If your brother offends you, you go and speak with him. If he won't listen to you, you bring two or three others. If he won't listen to those, you bring the ecclesia. Now that doesn't mean you bring the matter up before the ecclesia. You take a vote in a disfellowship. That is what that's about. That means the ecclesia is now involved in the deliberations with this person. So John is saying, I'm coming. I'm going to speak with you face to face because I am going to bring up in the company of the ecclesia what this man's actions are. We're going to deal with it. So this tells us the, uh, the degree of spiritual danger that Diotrephes was in. He had rejected the word of the apostle. He had rejected the words of the two or three others. So now his actions were to be considered by the whole ecclesia. And if he were to reject the ecclesia's counsel, well, we know what the Lord says next in Matthew 18, don't we? Let him be as a heathen man, and a publican. Now, a lot of times that's taken to mean shun him. I don't believe that that's what the, the, uh, the Lord's intent was. I don't believe that this means that Diotrephes or the offender in Matthew 18 was to be shunned. But rather that that individual by their actions have put them in a situation from which they desperately need to be reclaimed. This is clearly stated by the Lord in Luke 5. But the scribes and Pharisees murmured against the disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Jesus answering said unto them, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The need of the sinner, the publican, the heathen in that sense. They desperately needed to be reclaimed. Didotrophy's hold on the principles of the truth was tenuous at best as demonstrated by his actions. If he was to remain stubborn in his ways, that means the truth was not really in him. And he was like the sinners and publicans that Christ fellowship with. Now Christ fellowship with these sinners and publicans, not because they were the ones who welcomed him, but rather because they so desperately needed him. So the spirit of Matthew 18, it's an expression, if you will, of the need of that person how desperate their need is. And we should be concerning ourselves with reclaiming them out of the way in which they are so stubbornly set. Okay. So, there were no words like love or faithfulness in uh, John's speaking to Diotrephes. Not even the word truth, really. There was only a warning. So what was it about Diotrephes then that, that uh, warranted this hard posture, if you will, from, from John? Well, typically the word the first thing that the word presents to our attention is usually the most important thing in any circumstance. Think of like Genesis chapter six. In Genesis chapter six, you know, this is the flood and Noah and, 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 and we know of all the violence and corruption and, but what's the first thing we're presented with? Everybody knows this. The sons of God saw the daughters of men. Okay? That's the first thing we're presented with. 
the degeneration of the ecclesia is the most important aspect of the flood. Because Peter tells us that Noah and his family were saved by the flood. They weren't saved from the flood by the flood. They were saved from the degeneration that was going on all around them. God saved Noah and his family from that atmosphere of godlessness. So the first thing that's presented to us about Diotrephes, simple, he loved preeminence. In the Greek, it's one word, philo proteo, horribly mispronounced. Well, philo, a philo, right? We, we understand that. That's love, of course. And protos means to be first, means to be the chief. It's a, it's a position of honor. So right away, when we read that Diotrephes love preeminence, our minds should go to the words of the Lord. Many that are first, protos, shall be last, and the last shall be first. So first there is that Greek word protos, and last is the word eskatos. I'm probably saying that a little more Spanish than Greek in my voice, but... So be it. But what that, what that word means is the lowest in rank or worth. So Christ is saying that those who have aspirations to be the chief, if that's in our heart, well, the result will be something very much different altogether. Because that one who has those aspirations will be the least worthy, which means the least desired. Christ tells us over and over again to, to humble ourselves that we might be exalted. Because if we exalt ourselves, God is going to humble us. Diotrephes demonstrated his desire to be chief by belittling others like John, by prating against them with malicious words. That means, the word prating means to speak false accusations. The ESV has talking wicked nonsense about us. The NIV has gossiping maliciously about us. And the word malicious, it's the way that we would use that word. It's something that's troublesome. It's harmful, morally wrong. That's what malicious is. There's an evil aspect of it, but it's, it's actually applied. Right? If, I'm, I, if I'm malicious towards you, I'm applying an evil intent in my relationship with you. So it's not latent. It's active. This man was actively malicious or actively evil towards his brethren. So these words came forth from a malicious heart, for the Lord spoke truly when he said, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. I get to stick to my notes now because I'm running out of time. So the way that this, this brother spoke harmfully and wickedly against his brother brethren reveals his inner character. The truth had not made strong enough or large enough inroads into his heart. For the truth will change a man from, from that inner natural evil way. Diotrephes was resistant to any change of this sort. And Diotrephes' words were toxic, poisoning the minds and the hearts of his ecclesia, or those of the, I should say, those who were in the ecclesia were Diotrephes. That was Diotrephes' problem, wasn't it? He thought it was his ecclesia. So we shouldn't say it was his ecclesia, but you know what I mean, right? 
this is our ecclesia. It not even belongs to me, but this is the ecclesia that we belong in. Well, he was poisoning the hearts and the minds of the ecclesia that he belonged to. And a strong personality can often make a strong case against someone, even if it is wrong. Diotrephes exercised his inner passion for self-glory by bringing other people down. And this seems to be a common trait in godless men. Build myself up by tearing you down, right? If you're down, I'm up. I look good. Well, that was Diotrephes. And instinctively, we know that this is against one of the first principles of God's truth. Self-glory, self-righteousness, self-centeredness, all destroy the most fundamental aspect of our relationship with God and his son. And that's humility. You can't be humble when you're seeking self-glory, when you're self-centered, when you're self-righteous. Isaiah 57, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. And Isaiah 66, All those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. And the same prophet gives us this warning from Yahweh. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. The Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. The loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Diotrephes loved the preeminence over his brethren. And he exercised the spirit by turning away those brethren that Gaius was welcoming. He had no compassion for their needs, so much so that he forbade anyone in his ecclesia from giving to them. And if they did, well, he would, uh, his, his perception was so warped that he saw this as a challenge to his authority and, and, and anyone who's, who's challenging, his, challenging his authority must be cast out. If you don't agree with Diotrephes, then you are cast out. Right? It's Diotrephes way or the highway. It's basically what he's saying. So Diotrephes, in his own mind, was like the sky over the lowly earth. The lowly earth was personified in men like Gaius. And so the names of these two men summarize the story. Diotrephes was like the apostles when they argued over who would be the greatest and the Lord answered there, bickering with these words, Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The Lord counseled his followers to aspire to service, not to dominance, not to control. He counseled his followers to humility, not pride or arrogance. So the inner character of Gaius and Diotrephes was made open to others in the way that they lived their lives. John saw it perfectly clearly. One was a faithful servant. The other is a domineering, sanctimonious overlord. So this is the story then of 3 John. A humble, faithful brother who does what he is able for the sake of the truth 
and an arrogant, spiteful brother who thinks the ecclesia exists for him and who has no interest whatsoever in being a fellow helper of the truth. But what about Demetrius? Did we forget him? I didn't forget him. Why is he mentioned by name in this letter in a seemingly offhand manner? Not a lot is said about Demetrius. What is said is good, as what was said about Gaius. So this man's name means belonging to Demeter. Now remember we had Gai, which was personification of the earth. We had Zeus. Now we have Demeter. And Demeter was the goddess of agriculture. And this is significant because it links Demetrius. Demetrius, who was highly reg regarded by all, highly regarded even by the truth, John says. And by the way, the definite article is there. In verse 12, Hi, a good report of all men and of the truth itself. The truth commended Demetrius because he was faithful to it. Because the truth doesn't commend no, none other. The truth only commends those who are faithful to it. The idea is that when the man Diotrephes was put up beside the principles of the truth, he was shown in a favorable light. And this is certainly something that we should all aspire to. But think of this man's name in relation to Gaius. Demeter, the goddess of agriculture. Gai, personification of the earth. Gaius personified the spirit of service, the humble, lowly brother. Demetrius' name speaks of agriculture, and that's land that is fruitful. Not just dormant land, but land that is bringing forth fruit. Gaius, Gi, the land. Demetrius, Demeter, the working of the land to bring forth fruit. When we put them together, we get a wonderful picture of spiritual service. We are to be humble, like Gaius, in recognizing the things that we can do for the truth, and we need to be up and doing, actively cultivating good works by that humble spirit of service for the sake of the truth. Not for self-glory, not for preeminence, but to be a fellow helper. Fellow helper with God and Christ, who have commissioned us into service. This is expressed in Demetrius. That's why I think his name is, is brought into the picture. You have the lowly servant, but it's not, it's not just enough to be a lowly servant. You actually have to serve. We have to get up and do. And Gaius and Demetrius together, this is the good which John counsels us to follow in verse 11. Beloved, Follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that does good is of God, but he that does evil has not seen or known God. And I went over. 